Welcome to another edition of the Bear Market Brief Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron, and this week, we're back to Ukraine. On an earlier episode of the podcast, we were joined by our Ukraine team, that's Fabrice Dupre and Eilish Hart, to talk about what, at the time, were upcoming local elections, as well as a brewing constitutional crisis. To put it very bluntly, we have updates, and so they're back. We had a great conversation about the growing risk to the Zelensky presidency and got into some political economy as well. We hope you enjoy. Eilish and Fabrice, thank you so much for coming back to the Bear Market Brief podcast. Hi, Aaron. Thanks for having us. Last we recorded in our youth, what was it, months ago? I have no sense of the passage of time these days, but we were looking at two issues. We had upcoming regional elections. And we had a brewing issue about Ukraine's constitutional court. And at the time, they were throwing, I guess, a wrench in the gears relating to Ukraine's corruption agency. Now, since then, one of those issues has been resolved. We have closure. We have facts. And the other issue has not been resolved at all in a big way. So let's start with the elections first. What happened? This year's big political showdown, the local elections in Ukraine. So there were elections for mayors, local councils, regional councils. And basically what happened is what mostly everyone expected. So the party of Volodymyr Zelensky did not repeat its performance of last year when it took you know, a majority in the parliament, which was the biggest majority in the modern Ukraine history. That did not happen again, though from what we can see, Servant of the People also did not perform that bad. Basically, Servant of the People became party among others. Like It's not anymore this massively dominant party. It's not also dead. It's now a party along with the pro-Russian opposition platform, the conservative pro-Western European Solidarity Party, and now it's trying to find for place. And I think there is a, a data point that kind of indicate this pretty well. If we look at the results for the regional council, so for the, at the oblast level, Servant of the People took the biggest share of the vote in four regions. The pro-Russian opposition platform took the biggest share of the vote also in four regions. And Poroshenko's pro-Western slash conservative European Solidarity Platform took the biggest share of the vote in four regions as well. So you have this kind of balance. And for Zelensky, it was more in Western Ukraine. For the opposition platform, it was more in Southern Ukraine. And for Poroshenko, it was more in Western Ukraine. So, you know, the political landscape has kind of settled a little bit. And I would say the second main trend is the domination of local parties. Because, you know, I mentioned like four, four regions, four regions, and four regions. That's obviously not all the regions. And most of the other ones, it was local politicians who formed their own parties and took pretty commanding victories. Interesting. So I guess kind of paraphrasing what you say, it almost sounds to me like Servant of the People has kind of evolved from this extra political entity, like we're the outsiders, to now... Because Zelensky is an incumbent, because he's you know had to do politics, just feels like a regular political party. Then is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think in one way this was always going to happen. I think there was no way that Zelensky party would like repeat the massive victory that they had last year. At the same time, it's also pretty obvious that they didn't really do a lot of work in the regions to try to really develop an actual you know implementation on the ground to fight against parties who have been developing regional networks for years and maybe even more than a decade in some case. So they probably still could have done better than they did, but they were never going to paint the whole map of Ukraine green like they did last year. Fair enough. Makes sense. Eilish. Yeah, I think the other thing that's important to kind of note about these elections, even compared to the past regional elections in 2015, the turnout was a record low. Like in terms of who actually voted in these elections, it was around like 37% turnout, which is I think at least 10% lower than the 2015 elections. And I think a lot of what happened in this context was there was a lot more impetus for people voting for the opposition to come out and vote. And when I say the opposition, I mean those opposed to 
servant of the people and Zelensky and those kind of opposing the center seemed to be the people who actually came out and voted. And a lot of this had to do with kind of tensions between the center and the regions that have been completely exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic, just because handling that issue got handed down to the regional elites. On top of the fact that since you've had decentralization reforms and they've been in charge of more money and been able to do more, or at least make it look like they're doing more, a lot of the pandemic handling came down to the local level. And that really gave regional elites and local parties and leaders and like incumbent mayors a sort of boost because it was a very concrete issue that they were able to say, like, we dealt with this, the center did not. And I think a lot of people in the regions genuinely very much felt that way. And so you see them voting for kind of the powers that be and local parties because they feel like they're the ones who are handling local issues. Whereas servant of the people's, you know, candidates, they're just trying to break in at the regional level and get a seat at the table, which they managed to do. And I think in that sense, it's a it's a bit of a success, but I don't think they ever should have expected the kind of sweep that they got in 2019, because at this point, they're dealing with normal politics that it's harder to mobilize people to care about in the first place. Like people in Ukraine will come out and vote, you know, for the presidential elections and the parliamentary elections in waves because that's the conception that people have of where political power lies. Whereas like kind of local issues that are handled at the local level, either people think, you know, people who are from here will care about this the most, or they think elections at this level don't really matter. Political change doesn't come from here. So I'm not going to vote at all. And I think that's kind of a dynamic that came out very clearly when you look at the results. So follow up, just because, you know, following the elections here in the United States, I was glued to the television or Twitter for an entire week straight, as were many of my colleagues. One of the shifts that's kind of been observed in American politics, and I wonder if we can draw almost a parallel here, is that in the past, it was thought that kind of your marginal non-voter, like the person who you might turn out if you could really get people active, was left-leaning, and that would benefit Democrats. And what we learned this year is that in a high turnout election, now Biden won the popular vote by a, a fairly comfortable margin, but in a high turnout election, this marginal voter actually, because of the way politics are, may be more right-leaning than was previously thought. Like the American political polity is, is shifting a little bit in that regard. With For Ukraine, might it be the case that the folks now who are less likely to vote are more friendly towards Zelensky? Is the same kind of anti-systemic motivation still there, but just not motivating people in a local off, I don't say off cycle, because it you know, doesn't necessarily work the same way in Ukraine, but is the kind of average non-voter more pro Zelensky than the electorate that turned out in this uh, local race? That's a tough one. I can give you one data point, which is that young people in Ukraine still tend to be pretty pro Zelensky. And in local elections like this, they tend to not vote. So that probably did hurt Zelensky's party quite a bit. Beyond that, I think it's difficult to say because, again, the, the election were really focused on local matters because, well, it was, it was a local election. So, yeah, on where is the non-voter standing? can be a bit difficult to say. But yes, young people did not go out and they probably would, a lot of them would probably have supported Zelensky. Fair enough. I actually had a point. Yeah, I mean, one one argument I saw made about this was in um, an op-ed that Konstantin Skorkin wrote for Carnegie. And he said that, you know, kind of going into this election and, and even during last year's election, Servant of the People has tried to position itself as a political center. In terms, like if we're speaking ideologically, they've tried to kind of put themselves at the center of the political spectrum in Ukraine. And that what, what he argued was that the political center that Sermon of the People has tried to present isn't the one people are looking for. And so what you're going to see is politics kind of polarize once again. And then at some point, there will be a centrist project that tries to pull things back together, but it might not be Zelensky and it might not be Servant of the People. I think that's a really interesting argument. But I don't necessarily think it applies to local elections, because like Fabrice said, local elections are about local issues. And I think if you don't have young people voting and you don't have people voting necessarily according to ideology, then you're not going to get the pull for Zelensky and for Servant of the People that you saw at the parliamentary or presidential level. So that's like, that's one interesting thing to think about just because the the analysis that's come out after this election and based on the results is that like the Ukrainian political landscape looks like 
it's polarizing. And I mean, I think that's an argument that kind of gets put on Ukrainian politics a lot is that you have it it polarizing in terms of like pro West, pro Russia, etc. But I think like, one thing that really needs to be kept in mind is that last year's elections were completely exceptional. And this year is more of a norm. And I don't necessarily think it reflects polarization to like a new degree so much as it's a pretty normal level of political pluralism for Ukraine that's just swinging back and and coming back into place. And now Servant of the People kind of fits into it in a way that it didn't last year because it was brand new, right? I think it's kind of found its place in the landscape. And that's going to be more obvious kind of at the local level than the national level. I mean, I don't think you would expect any party in any country to sweep up in local elections, like for city councils or things like that. You know what I mean? I don't think it's a normal expectation to have. So really interesting, I guess, framing to say that, you know, Zelensky coming to power, that wasn't necessarily a new normal so much as that was the outlier. And now what we see now is Russian to the mean for Ukrainian politics. And this is going to tie into our closing question today. So stay tuned for this exciting matter. I guess one related question, especially with local politics, and just to add, I mean, I read that a lot of the incumbent mayors in the prim- in the large cities tended to retain power, which I think speaks very well to the point that this is kind of a return to, if not the status quo, but maybe the status quo, like it's Zelensky and, and servant of the people fitting into the political order. I guess given what's happening around the world with COVID and COVID coming back, well, never left, but getting worse in a big way. I think we should probably touch on the situation in Ukraine, especially as it may have educated A, uh, Zelensky's popularity, but also maybe his performance. Is there a perception in Ukraine that the national government has things under control? The perception is not good. No, I think there is. And, uh, you know, speaking here from Kiev in my first weekend uh, lockdown, which is what the government has kind of enacted. So during the weekend, at least officially, everything except for supermarkets and pharmacies are supposed to be closed. They've had a lot of problem with that because actually at the time of this recording, the um, local election are not really over yet since we have second rounds in several cities. And this has probably made it a bit harder because many mayors you know, have said that they would not actually enforce the weekend lockdown. In Lviv, they've decided that Saturday and Sundays were actually not weekend days. So no weekend lockdown makes perfect sense. So they've had a big problem of enforcing general quarantine rules and measures in the region. You know, this kind of regional rebellion has already happened in the summer. They've also had troubles. They've created a kind of big COVID fund to you know fight the pandemic, most of which has gone to road construction, which obviously has not been welcomed well. All in all, we are not right now yet at the point of complete disaster yet, let's say. The hospitals are not saturated yet, but the trend is bad and is perceived as bad. Uh, we've had you know record new infections every day in the past week, really expected to be worse. Well, that's optimistic. So speaking of optimistic notes, we started with elections and kind of doubling back to what we began with. Last time we had a chat, the Constitutional Court of Ukraine had created a little problem with the anti-corruption agency, NABU, as it's called in Ukrainian, ruling it was essentially unconstitutional. We were wondering if we get closure there. And the answer is no, not at all. The Ukrainian Constitutional Court has actually now essentially, and we'll talk about the details here, but ruled much of the entire reform agenda unconstitutional. Uh, There's a couple of key points. I think it related to laws banning self-enrichment, asset declarations, a whole slew of very popular, or relatively popular at least, agenda items. So can you tell us a little bit more about A, what specifically, you know, what are the, the issues at play? And now what Zelensky is trying to do to force the agenda through in in light of this, I think he is looking to abolish the court and start it again. Could you kind of walk us through what's happened since? 
This is an issue where I think it's very easy to kind of get bogged down in the details yeah. and constitutional law is is not the easiest to explain. But I think what, what the kind of key points here are, the Constitutional Court of Ukraine essentially abolished the asset declaration system for officials. And that is a very foundational piece of kind of the anti-corruption infrastructure that got put in place after the Maidan revolution in 2014. And the kind of knee-jerk reaction that Zelensky had was, you know, you have to do something fast. So he put forward a bill that would essentially dismiss all of the judges on the Constitutional Court of Ukraine. And this creates a whole new set of issues because the president and the parliament aren't empowered to do that. So you kind of have problems going on at two levels. On the one hand, you have this kind of like an extension of this attack on the country's anti-corruption infrastructure. And then you have, you know, the parliament and the president trying to come up with a political solution that is in itself unconstitutional in the way they've proposed handling it. So like the way I look at it is that this is like kind of a crisis on two levels that's very hard to find a legal or political solution to because fixing the problem would require the cooperation of the judges on the constitutional court if you're going to do it according to the country's laws. Do you want to jump in for Brees? You summed it up pretty well. Like now there is this dilemma on how to solve this crisis without breaking the constitution. Right now, the solution that we seem to be driving towards is that Zelensky's bill on just downright you know, firing all the constitutional judges, it looks like it's not going to go through. Rather, there are currently several bills in the parliament where the goal would be to just paralyze the constitutional court. So right now you have 15 judge, judges of a total of 18, but three have not been appointed yet. And for example, you have a bill which would require at least 17 judges to be present to take decisions. So that would de facto paralyze the constitutional court because they only have 15 judges. And at the same time, they would want to you know, revive the laws that were struck down by the constitutional court, which is of course, more of a you know hot fix than an actual solution to the core of the problem. But I think right now they felt like that was the best they could do in the light of the situation, which is that, yeah, this acid declaration system has kind of this really strong symbolic weight where, you know, you have this situation right now where everybody in Ukraine can go on Google and type the name of not just a politician, but literally any official down to the local level. So, you know, your local mayor in your village of 500 inhabitants, you can type his name on Google and you'll get his acid declaration. And this has been used by journalists, activists. It's one of, if not the most successful, at least the most visible aspects of the anti-corruption reforms in the last few years. And so when they you know, moved against the system, there was a really, really, really strong reaction, both from Zelensky himself, who, you know, just a day after conveyed the National Security Council and said that this was security threat, national security threat, and from civil society. Yeah, I just wanted to add, like, it's it's very hard to, like, understate how shocking this decision was for, for civil society in Ukraine and for the expert community. I think, like, the week that it happened when I was trying to put together the expert brief, I was actually struggling to find, like, kind of a breakdown of what exactly this meant because the knee-jerk response was just so much outrage like in terms of if you're reading op-eds and what people are writing on Facebook and Twitter and stuff like the response was just outrage and shock and like it really for I think a lot of people it looked as though the kind of constitutional court judges had gone after one of the most tangible pieces of anti-corruption infrastructure that the country has managed to put in place and so that's, you know, very, very alarming because it's a it's a real public symbol of what, you know, anti-corruption reform means. At the same time, like this decision is just completely embarrassing for Zelensky because he ran on an anti-corruption platform. So to have something like this come about, you know, like a year into his presidency is just, you know, completely contrary to what he promised the population. But it's also as we've seen in terms of like the solutions they've tried to present, it's it's largely out of his control. And I think 
uh, one of the problems with trying to fix this at the parliamentary level is that when the judges kind of passed this decision, they didn't include a justification for what made, because I mean, they struck down these, the laws concerning this infrastructure as unconstitutional. They didn't include a justification. So that doesn't give parliament room to amend these laws in a way that will prevent them from getting declared unconstitutional again in the future. And so the kind of legal solutions we've seen proposed, the draft laws they've put forward are kind of an attempt to, like Fabrice said, paralyze the court, reintroduce this legislation. But I mean, it, if you don't successfully paralyze the court, which isn't really a solution, then the constitutional court judges can just turn around and declare all this legislation unconstitutional again, because the, what they're, they're not presenting amending it. They're just trying to put it back and pretend this didn't happen. So it's a, it's a real kind of terrible position that they've put the parliament and Zelensky in. So not to question anyone's motivations here, I guess I'll ask as far as what people are saying versus making an accusation. Um, I guess, Fabrice, I can ask you, are people saying that this may be, well, a corruption law issue, but a corruption issue on the court itself, that there may be another kind of agenda at play? Because, I mean, not to make another tenuous comparativist statements, but at least here in the States, the Supreme Court generally is aware of politics and not doing anything that would deliberately, you know, harm their uh, legitimacy or political interests can talk about that at a greater length. But what are folks saying about why the court may have done this, especially now? Yeah, there is absolutely a suspicion that judges of the court could have been influenced. You know, at the start, if we go back to the very start of this crisis, it started with a complaint by 47 members of parliament, 44 of which, if I'm not mistaken, were from the pro-Russian opposition platform. You also have, and I don't have the exact numbers in my head, but judges for the constitutional court are appointed for nine years. So many of them were appointed by Yanukovych, who was, of course, toppled in the 2014 many of which have, yes, problematic, actually also considering looking at their asset declaration that has also been in a problematic angle, let's say. So yeah, there is also definitely a feeling that this move is not, you know, is not just looking at the constitutionality of the law. Because, you know, the, the law itself is not completely, you can criticize it. There are certainly some aspects which can be problematic. But considering the members of the court, considering the timing as well, there's pretty clearly a political agenda. Yeah, I, I was just going to add, I mean, if you really want to keep this from happening again, because realistically it could, even if you just put everything back in place and pretend it's all fine, like you wouldn't just have to have this group of judges, you know, dismissed or have them agree to all step down, which I think is highly unlikely. Like you would actually need to reform the selection process for judges on the constitutional court to, you know, kind of make sure that the, the process for appointing people has a certain amount of integrity and is done by some kind of independent commission or something or along those lines. And that will require changes to the laws governing the constitutional court. It will re require changes to parliamentary procedure. So I think they, in, in a way, it, it looks as though these judges are kind of trying to protect their own interests and keep people from looking into what assets they may have. But at the same time, I mean, they've kind of triggered, I think maybe they've triggered a bigger problem than they anticipated, or they just didn't care <laughs> that it was going to do all of this. So speaking of bigger problems, just with a view on time here, where does this leave President Zelensky heading into 2021? Uh, it doesn't sound like he's in a particularly enviable position. What being an incumbent, kind of his, the gravity of politics has turned servant of the people into a regular political party. He's, uh, I guess, in a position where other parties, by opposing his reform effort, can just score political points, doesn't even matter the reform agenda. So where does he stand now? Okay, yeah, he's in a difficult position. I think if we look back, okay, so 2019 was triumphant election, triumphant presidential election, triumphant parliamentary election, he's riding very high. 2020 would be more the year of normal politics, let's say, you know, expectation have been kind of dashed, he's trying to push forward with some policies, he's going backwards in some areas, he's facing opposition. Now he gets COVID on top of that. And now as 2021 happens, so he's facing opposition from both sides, either from, let's say, pro-Western opposition and the more pro-Russian opposition platform. 
It still remains popular, which I think is something that should not be underestimated because he is already kind of this, you know, a good czar, bad boy or strategy uh, where he's been blaming blaming officials, uh, blaming, in the case of the coronavirus pandemic, blaming regions. So I think he will do that even more. He probably will have to push forward with reforms in the anti-corruption sphere because Ukraine needs money and the IMF, the European Union, are still holding significant tranche of financial aid until first the constitutional court crisis is solved. And then they still have issues with the central bank and with several reforms, which is why currently nobody really expects the IMF to unlock the second tranche of aid this year. It could happen this next year. And lastly, I think we could also see Zelensky kind of focus on the Donbass conflict, which has always been kind of his main, I'd say, one of the area where he's maybe slightly more at ease, at least in terms of communication, in terms of policies, it's a bit more difficult. But he's had some, he's had at least one significant success this year, which has been the ceasefire, which has now been holding since the end of July. Just a few days ago, they opened new checkpoints on the new entry exit crossing points as they are officially called on the front line which is again something that has been attempted many times in the last few years and that always failed until now so there are success successes which i think he'll try to build on probably not towards an actual resolution of the conflict because there are still red lines both in kiev and moscow which no one really is ready to work through but in terms of this more humanitarian strategy of trying to solve issues on the ground, which could also make him more popular. So yes, he's in a very difficult position, but you know, he still has some hope, let's say. Uh, she had a comment? Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty much fair to say that any plans Zelensky had for this year and for 2021 have been kind of completely derailed by the pandemic. But yeah. I think the poll he introduced at the local elections, I mean, I know it it really came off as a political gimmick. It's not representative at all in terms of the responses it got. But I think in terms of the question he questions he posed, because it was completely framed as Zelensky's poll, it even said it like on the piece of paper, like that it was from the president of Ukraine. I think it gives a good indication of where his head is at in terms of the key issues he's trying to focus on. And I think it, it sort of shows that his agenda hasn't really changed that much. Like there's still a focus on combating large scale corruption. There's still a focus on security. The question about the free economic zone for Donbass is an interesting one in terms of, uh, like Fabrice said, this sort of humanitarian approach to the conflict since sort of the international negotiations, things aren't moving at that level. Whereas like making these humanitarian steps, keeping the ceasefire in place and moving towards some kind of economic reintegration might be a more like fruitful solution to the problem, or at least one that would uh, like Fabrice said, kind of make Zelensky more popular in terms of his approach to dealing to this with this issue. I think the other big thing for 2021 will be the Biden presidency is going to be a real change for Ukraine in terms of foreign policy, because there's been a lot of hope placed on what a Biden presidency will mean in terms of US-Ukraine relations getting kind of on a better track since Biden has previously stated that he does plan to make Ukraine a priority with the condition that a lot of this will hinge on anti-corruption reforms. Um, and there has been talk before about pulling the U.S. into the Normandy negotiations in terms of resolving the Donbass conflict. So that would be like an actual very clear development at that level that is something they could try to push for now that they're not trying to deal with Trump. So those are kind of the things that I see being his priorities going into next year once he gets over the coronavirus <laughs> on a <Right>. personal level. <laughs> Let's hope, let's hope that happens. So as a final point here, expanding for a couple minutes on a topic I'm sure you could write an entire book about. So anyone listening who wants or needs a, a book idea, you know, please take this for free. We talked about in this chaotic situation in Ukraine as normal politics, the reform agenda's floundering, expectations are dashed. And I don't want to say this as, you know, a, a proven fact, but at least in the way it's frequently covered in Western media, Ukraine seems to uniquely among you know, former Soviet countries, especially in Eastern Europe, have a reform issue, or at least the way it's portrayed. And I want to talk quickly about you know, whether that's true, if it is true, what might be at play there? If it's not true, why are we being fair to Ukraine? 
But it seems like we had, what, the 2004 Orange Revolution didn't really yield the results that folks were hoping for. We had now, you know, Maidan, we're seeming to get bogged down again. So I guess asking the question on a broader level, does Ukraine have a reform problem? Yes, it is a big question. And I will say, you mentioned, you said that's something uh, someone could write a book about. And I will mention that actually at least one book that I know of, which has been written about that, it's called Two Roads Diverge, The Transition Experience of Poland and Ukraine. So check that out. Does Ukraine have a reform problem? I It is something I find very hard to answer, especially even if we only stay focused on you know, just the issue of corruption, which is always kind of the, the main issue, where I sometimes feel like there is expectations which are a bit overblown, or at least the idea that you just need to take a series of decisions that will lead to the end of corruption, which of course is never that easy when you have such a massive, you know, systemic, literally systemic issue. I'll jump in and say, I think, I, I, I think you'd be hard pressed to say that Ukraine doesn't have a reform problem. Like there it's whatever they've, you know, what they've done so far clearly hasn't yielded the results they wanted. I think at the same time, Ukraine has an expectations problem in terms of the expectations that, you know, uh, civil society and it, it has for the country's capacity to reform and how quickly reform can happen. And then sort of the expectations that get put upon the country in terms of international scrutiny. Like when when your reform agenda is constantly predicated on these revolutions, which just bring, you know, expectations up to 100 that you're going to see a complete and total change. And then, of course, you know, implementing actual reforms through democratic process is slow by nature, then of course, it's going to look like things have you haven't gotten the kind of change you bargained for you know, during this revolution, I think, like, revolution and reform are two very different things. And I think that heightens expectations a lot. In terms of actually implementing it, that that becomes a very different question. I think, at the same time, international scrutiny does sort of change the sort of expectations placed on Ukraine, because Ukraine, in a lot of ways, is sort of trying to push to get into the club. And if we just look at kind of EU Ukraine relations, you know, in in isolation, like Ukraine is trying to take these steps to prove that it can reform to the extent that it would be, you know, kind of an acceptable member state. Whereas at the same time, there are countries within the EU that are dealing with, you know, huge levels of corruption, but aren't subject to the same amount of scrutiny because they're, they're already in. So I think like, if you look at corruption issues in Hungary and Bulgaria and, and states that are, you know, in Ukraine's neighborhood, they have similar problems, but the, the expectations are different. So that that's kind of my answer. Like, I think I don't think you can say that there isn't a reform problem, but I think there's also an expectations problem, and it comes from within and without. It's a very good point, Fabrice. You have another point. And um, and yeah, Ukraine. You know, Ukraine is big. It's biggest uh, biggest country in Europe, uh, except for uh, Russia. And I think it also has a political problem where you know, if there is one thing that has survived everything in the last well, in the last two decades in the last three decades, by the way. It's this system of what I guess you could call, you know, pluralistic oligarchism, where you have this group of about a dozen, let's say, extremely powerful oligarchs, which have an extremely strong influence on the country's politics, which have various interests, which is where the pluralism comes into play. There is real pluralism in Ukraine. There are parties with very different interests who are appealing to different voters, but who also have an interest in maintaining the status quo. And they have been able to maintain this status quo throughout everything, pretty much, throughout massive economic crisis, throughout two revolutions, throughout the annexation of Crimea, the conflict in eastern Ukraine. You know, they went a big reason that the 2014 revolution was so successful is that by that point, pretty much all of the countries the oligarch had turned against uh, Yanukovych. So there was this consensus among all oligarchs against Yanukovych because Yanukovych had amassed a huge amount of power and was basically shaking the status quo because he was trying to, you know, get all the power to himself. And so these oligarchs had this interest in moving against that. And how do you shake this status quo? Uh, I mean, I, 
very obviously do not uh, do not know because this pluralism makes it very powerful i think because there is always a way for an oligarch to you know create a new political project that will push forward some different ideas and this other oligarchs can create a different one and you have a very lively political life yeah i feel like kind of in, in following ukrainian politics you know in varying degrees of closeness over the last five or six years now kind of the the, the takeaway I, I seem to, to to get is that as far as you know the federal government's power, well, it's not a federation, but the central government's power, let's say it's more accurate, is either not weak enough or not strong enough. It, it strikes me that there's kind of an, an unhappy middle ground where state capacity, it's, it's, yeah, there's, there's not enough of it. it. It needs to be either stronger or weaker. But where we're at, where we're at now is, uh, is a difficult place. Like I said, well, I was going to say that, that you could write a book on it, but there is already a book on it. it certainly could be an, a whole podcast episode, if not an entire series. I think we are out of time for today. Thank you for joining again. I'm sure we'll need to do another update given the rate at which these you know, various crises are evolving. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks again to Fabrice and Eilish for joining and thanks to you as well. We have a couple more episodes coming up before the holiday season, so stay tuned for updates. And be sure to follow BMB Russia and Ukraine at the Twitter handle at Bear Market Brief. The Bear Market Brief podcast is a production of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, that's FPRI, a nonpartisan think tank based in Philadelphia. For more updates on the podcast and other issues, be sure to stop by fpri.org. We'll catch you next time.